First Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Uh, if anyone speaks, let him speak as of the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. The churches that Peter is writing to are experiencing, as we've been going through First Peter, are experiencing affliction and rejection. And so as we've been uh, going through the, uh, the book, we, we've come to the point of seeing that what he's doing at this point is exhorting them to remain steadfast in the face of the persecution. Now, persecution by this time has become fairly common in the lives of believers. You can look all the way back at the beginning of the church. The church was around six years of, of age or so, about six years old, and persecution began against the believers very early. When you remember the uh, chapter 7 of the book of Acts, you remember that uh, that chapter records that Stephen, one of the early church leaders, had been martyred for his witness for Christ. And according to chapter 8, verse 1 of the book of Acts, after he was martyred, persecution began in earnest. It says in Acts 8, verse 1, Saul, Saul was consenting to his death. And at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. So over 25 years later, persecution is now commonplace. And so Peter is telling them how to respond to it. Now, we've already seen that he's given them commands and encouragements. He's told them to be serious, to be watchful, to be prayerful. And what he's doing is he's pointing their eyes to heaven. He's giving them an eternal perspective. Now, when you read your Bible, you'll see that 1 Peter and the book of Hebrews were written around the same period. And the writer of Hebrews made reference to the suffering that believers were enduring at that time. Listen to what they were going through, Hebrews 10, 32 through 34. The writer says, Recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, of, you were brought to public shame, you were made a spectacle both by reproaches, by ridicule and tribulation, by persecution, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering, the confiscation of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. So they were going through great persecution, great affliction, reproaches, tribulations. They were made a spectacle of. They were plundered. That's what's taking place in the early church. So in the face of all of this persecution, Peter is instructing the believers to take care of one another. He has said, fervently love one another. Overlook petty differences. Be hospitable to one another. When undergoing persecution, these things are needed for believers to be able to survive. And so at this point, he continues instructing them. But he's sharing with them about how the church can be victorious He's going to be sharing with them about the ministry, the gifts of the Spirit, and how they operate. And so in verse 10, he says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So we're going to look at these uh, two verses for several minutes in our study tonight. I want to develop this with you. If there's anything that I think the church needs to be remembering at this period in history, it's that we're not people who simply attempt to do good in our own strength and our own power. Christianity is more than simply a philosophy. Christianity is a way of life that is actually empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. And there are a number of people who want to be good, but they don't have the power to be good. And so God has supplied to us the power that is necessary for us to be able to live in obedience to him and be victorious. And God has given us the Holy Spirit by his gift that enables us to, to serve him. I want you to see in verse 10 how he says, as each one has received a gift. That word gift is a Greek word, charisma, chrism. It is a grace gift that is bestowed, bestowed by the Holy Spirit, enabling us to serve God. And so every Christian, every person in this room right now who is a believer in Jesus Christ, born again, every one of us has a spiritual gift, at least one, that enables us to minister to the body of Christ. In the New Testament, there are various passages that speak concerning the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
You've seen it in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. You, you see it in, in, in 1 Peter here and 1 Peter 4. All of those uh, books mention the spiritual gifts. And various gifts are given to us in the New Testament, are explained and spoken of in passages found in those books I just mentioned. So there are gifts, uh, gifts like exhortation, the gift of giving, the gift of leadership, mercy, prophecy, service, teaching, administration, discernment of spirits, faith, healings, helps, the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues. There are numerous gifts that are mentioned in the New Testament, and these are gifts of the Spirit. So know that spiritual gifts are not natural abilities, but spiritual gifts are given by God. There's a very well-known pastor teacher, I'll leave unnamed, who um, I've used his commentaries over the years on many occasions, and for a good amount of years, I've, I've uh, regarded him as a, a very good teacher. Yet, it, when it comes to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you know, when he begins to try and explain the gifts of the Spirit, he naturalizes the gifts. He says that, for example, the gift of tongues is the ability to learn foreign languages. Um, the, uh, the gift of wisdom is the ability to... Um, uh, go to school and develop the capacity to counsel. The gift of knowledge, he says, is the ability to go to school and to gain a higher education. He naturalizes the gifts. But the Bible doesn't. The Bible doesn't naturalize the gifts. These are spiritual gifts. They're called charisms. They're gifts of God. These are gifts that the Lord has made available by the Holy Spirit. And the gifts, according to Paul in his writings, are intended for us to minister to somebody else to the glory of God. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit, he says, of all. So part of the purpose of spiritual gifts is for the edifying of the body of Christ. They aren't, to, they aren't given to us to make someone famous. They're given to the body for the building up of the people of God. He says in 1 Corinthians 14, 12, so it is with you, since you are eager for gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. So as you read Scripture, you may read of certain gifts, and you might say, boy, I'd like to exercise that particular gift. And There's nothing wrong with desiring certain gifts. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, it says, follow the way of love, eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, but especially prophecy. So the important thing is knowing that you can ask for them, but also realizing that it is God who gives as he wills. I may want a particular gift, and there, are, there have been particular gifts that I've, I've, I've wished that the Lord would have bestowed on me that I would have the ability to exercise by faith, but I don't receive those gifts. Um, so he makes the determination what gift I'm supposed to have. The Bible tells us, Again, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11, that the Spirit of God gives them to each one as he determines. And so we've received, every believer in this room, everyone here in this study right now, has received a, a spiritual gift, and it is to be exercised as we minister that gift to one another. And every member of the body has received this gift, and every member should exercise it. Every member of the body is intended to have a share in ministry. Now, our bodies have different members, but they make up one body, and each part of the body is necessary. If you were given an option before you leave tonight, and somebody said, you were told, well, you can leave, but you got to give up part of your body. And we're not talking about fat. We're talking about part of your body. <laughs> I think we'd have a line out the door. <laughs> yeah, I'll give up a few pounds. What part would you give up? Oh, sometimes you may get upset because of this or that. I don't like your, my hair or I don't like my whatever. What part would you give up? And the answer is probably none, non voluntarily. No. I, I'd like to stay with all that I have, right? And so we need to understand that each part of our body, though one portion may be used in a, in a way that maybe gains more attention than another, each part of our body is necessary, and the body of Christ is made up of, of a variety of people with gifts, and all of us are necessary because we're part of that body. 
In Ephesians 4.16, it says, From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And so each one of us as believers, and that's what he's talking about here in this passage, each has received a gift. We're to minister it to, uh, minister it to one another. Every one of us in this room, every believer listening to this study, has been given a gift by the Spirit of God, and we are to exercise it, and we're supposed to exercise it with fervent love as we serve one another for the, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the way that we exercise the gifts is an expression of God's manifold grace. Notice how he says in verse 10, he says, Each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So our expression of his gifts is revealing his manifold grace, the variety of the ways, in other words, that he has blessed us. And he begins to speak concerning how his grace has been bestowed on us and gifts. And he begins to speak of a couple of them in verse 11. He says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So he begins speaking of two particular gifts. Notice he says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as of the oracles of God. When's the last time you used the word oracles? We don't use that word. So what does the word oracle mean? Oracle literally speaks of the divine words. You're speaking the divine words of God. And I want to develop that with you. So when he says, if anyone speaks, that word speak covers forms of speaking, especially preaching and teaching, prophecy. And so what he's saying is you're to speak, you're going you're to use, utilize these gifts with a confidence. Why would I do that? He says, well, because, he says, you, you speak as the oracles of God. You're speak, <coughs> speaking with the confidence that the things that you communicate are not man-made stories or myths. They are not fables. They are God's words to man. You have to, if you're going to be a teacher, you can't go to a pulpit and not believe what you're teaching. You, you can't. There are a lot of people who do because they make a living out of it. You can go to Germany, and you can. There are jobs you can have as preachers in Germany. They're they're just a profession. You want to be an engineer, be an engineer. You want to be a school teacher, be a school teacher. You want to be a pastor, you can be trained to be a pastor. You don't even have to be a believer. And so there are jobs you can have. And some people have the job of quote unquote pastor teacher because it. It gives them a good, a good revenue. They can make money doing it. But that's not how it's supposed to be done. We're supposed to speak as the oracles of God. And every person who preaches the word of God needs to have a confidence that he's proclaiming what God himself has said. And that's where the preacher's effectiveness comes from. We're not trying to convince people of our opinion. We're presenting to them what God has said. Thus saith the Lord is something that pastor teachers need to do. We need to understand that. And so we speak with confidence because it's God's word. Charles Spurgeon was once asked, how do you defend the Bible? And he said, very easy. The same way I defend a lion, I simply let it out of its cage. And so you speak the word of God with a confidence because God's word is powerful. God gave us his truth. God has supplied us with his power. But God also supplies us with responsibility. And so we share with the faith-filled internal confidence that we are actually giving out the word of God. And that's how we can effectively deliver the message of the gospel. Now, obviously, when you read your Bible, there are great examples of those who delivered the message of God. The Old Testament prophets were given God's word, and the Old Testament prophets would deliver it accurately. A good example would be a young man by the name of Jeremiah. When you read book, the book of Jeremiah, especially chapter 1, God had called this young man to preach. But when God called him, Jeremiah resisted. He told the Lord, he said, I'm too young. But the Lord said in Jeremiah 1, 7 and 8, The Lord said to me, Do not say I'm a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, 
For I'm with you to deliver you, saith the Lord. Do not be afraid of their faces. What does that mean? Because they're ugly? (laughs) No. It means that one of the most difficult things a person can do is speak to groups of people. When people are are, um, actually asked the question, what is your greatest fear? The number one fear Americans still have is to speak in public. Number one fear. People do not like to get up in front of people and speak. It's one of the things they're the most afraid of. As a matter of fact, it's usually number one fear that people have. Because when you speak to people, you read people. When you're speaking to the people, you can see their faces, and they can respond, and you can be kind of moved by that. I remember I was given a Bible study. I used to do a Tuesday morning study many, many years ago. And it was a small group of people. There weren't more than 15 or 20 people in a small room that we used to use. And I'll never forget, I was sitting there and maybe six or seven feet away, that's how small the place is, there was a guy who would sit there right in front of me, right in front of me, and he would stare at me with this kind of like a mad dog expression. And he was a big dude. So I'm looking at him, and I still remember the first time he came in, and he sat there, and he's just staring at me as I'm speaking. And it makes you uncomfortable. You're thinking, what's this guy looking at me for? And you're teaching. He comes the next week, and he's teaching, and I'm teaching, he's just staring at me. I that would make, and, and he came all the time. And finally, the Tuesday morning stopped and, and all. And it turns out he was, he was a barber. And I got to know him. And he began cutting my hair. <laughs> and so one day, I, I was just there, and he's just cutting my hair. And he says, you remember when I used to come to the Tuesday morning study? I said, yeah. He said, I would sit there staring at you. And I go, yeah. He goes, you know what I was thinking? No, what? I was thinking, man, I'd love to cut his hair. That's, 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 that's a true story. That's what he was thinking. So you, 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 you be careful. <laughs> because you look at people, you think they're thinking something, when in fact, they're not. And so don't be nervous when you share. Speak with the confidence because it is God's word. And so that's what we're to do. We're to speak with the confidence of delivering the message of the Lord. And we don't alter the message to suit the hearer. You see, that's one of the signs of the last days. The Bible says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Why? Well, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Speak the word with confidence. Why? Because a time will come when people will not want a Bible study. I think we're in that day. Some of the largest churches that you see on TV are churches that don't have a teaching pastor. Some of the largest churches you see, Joel Osteen is one of them. He just goes up and speaks. He says, this is my Bible. You give some kind of an oath to the reality of it, and he never opens it again. And that's very common. And we're living in days like that. I could speak of other, but I'm just using that as an an example. Why is that? Well, because people no longer want to hear the truth. They don't want a Bible study. I'll be looking at this on Sunday. We're going to be looking at the Great Tribulation. I'll be sharing a little more detail about that. But you're not to alter the word to uh, suit the hearer. You're not to temp. You're not to change rather the message to make it easier to listen to. It's been said we're not to make the gospel acceptable to man. We need to remember that the gospel makes man acceptable to God. And that's the attitude you have when you're sharing, as difficult as it may be. And that's one of the reasons why the the pulpit should be honored and those who stand behind it should present the word of God as it is. The the pulpit is not not a place to show off our our preaching skills. The pulpit is not to be used to, to gain a personal following. The pulpit is to be used to present the word of God, a word that transforms lives. One of the things that people forget is that it can actually be dangerous when the world makes you a popular person when you're ministering. Jesus in Luke 6.26 said it like this. 
He said, Woe to you when all men speak well of you. For their fathers treated the false prophets in the same way. There are times when the word of God goes forth as a sword. And it, it divides. And sometimes, let's face it, it can be difficult. And when the Holy Spirit is operating through his word, it's a wise thing to allow the Holy Spirit to complete the operation. I've shared this. I haven't done it in a long time. Perhaps some of you may remember this, but many of you haven't heard this story. When I was 14, I went to school, and I'm a freshman in high school, and I have an ache in my side, and, and I, I forgot my lunch, you know, and I thought, you know, I don't want to stay here. So I went to the nurse, and the nurse calls my mom. My mom comes and picks me up and takes me home. And then my mom takes me to the doctor because I'm not well. And the doctor presses the side on my side and press it in, released it, and I just jumped. He said, this boy has a, uh, a bad appendix. And so they take me and they put me in, and they put me under. I still remember when they began to apply the anesthesia, they put a mask on me and they told me, um, you know, start counting from 100 to zero. I got to about 90 maybe. They said, you need to stop fighting it. And I went under. And then shortly after, I remember waking up during the operation when the doctor said scalpel. And the nurse, right in front of me, the nurse puts a scalpel in his hand. And I see him plunge it into my stomach. Man, I was out. I mean, I fainted immediately when that happened. <laughs> I learned something through that operation. When an operation is occurring, stay still. And sometimes when people are under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, they jump off the operating table and run out the door. When the Holy Spirit is operating, stay still. Why? The doctor said later, we were fortunate to get it out when we did because it burst in his hand when he removed it. He said, this would have poisoned your son's entire body, could have killed him. It had to be removed. And when the Holy Spirit through the word is convicting me or convicting you, stay still. Let him remove the thing that's hurting you. Instead of defending it in your mind and saying, it's really okay, or you don't understand, or this guy's judging. Every church I go to, they say the same thing, and it's just mean and unloving. Maybe the Holy Spirit is following you. He's the hound of heaven. And he may be following you from place to place, giving you the same message. You need to change. And that way you can survive. Not only survive, you can thrive. The preacher has to know that the word of God is the medicine of God. And the people need to receive it as it is. And so he cannot be afraid of them. He has to speak the truth because he's answerable to God himself. And when people are saying all great things about him, sometimes it's just because... He's saying things they like. Ezekiel, it's spoken of in the book of Ezekiel, how, how the Lord, paraphrasing how the Lord speaks to the prophet and says, son of man, they're speaking about you. They're standing in the, in, on the sides of the, of, the, of the road and they're saying, come in here what the man of God has to say. He said, and so they come and they assemble as if they're my people. He said, to them, you have become like someone who is skillfully playing a guitar and you have a beautiful singing voice. They like your skills and your abilities. They like a lot about you. He says, so they sit before you as people do. And they sit before you as if they're my people. And then he goes on to say this, but they are not my people. Why? Because they hear and they do not do. See, that's the most dangerous thing is to hear and not do. If you want to know the depth of God, learn to be obedient to the things of God. Because Jesus said, that if you obey his commands, he said, his father and he would abide with you. And he, Jesus said, I will manifest myself to you. And so he shows you some of the depth that you desire through your obedience. And so what we do as ministers is to give out the message of God. And it's a joy when we see people receive that message. Now, not everyone believes when they hear the gospel. And we see that often in the life of the Apostle Paul himself. And in the book of Acts, in chapter 9, verse 29, when he first began to minister, 
It says that Paul spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. So we don't expect everybody to listen patiently to us and to believe. And some are going to argue from their experience against Scripture and, and against the message. And somebody once said, isn't it amazing that almost everyone has an opinion to offer about the Bible, and yet so few have studied it? And that's true. Everybody seems to have an opinion on the Bible, and so few have even read it. And so what we do is we speak it, and you speak it with the, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit, and that's the point he's making. And so if anyone speaks, he says, make it clear. If anyone uh, speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. He goes on to say, if anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So if you speak, but also if you minister. So ministers, when he speaks of the minister, this is speaking of spirit-filled, spirit-led service to God and man. It's speaking of ministry. Now, he's not saying do not serve. He's not saying, um, uh, he's not saying serve the Lord in your flesh. He is saying, serve the Lord according to the leading and empowering of the Spirit. Now, one of our favorite scriptures, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, everybody has heard this scripture before. Pa Calvary Pastors, it's one of the foundational scriptures of our ministries, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit who does the work. And what we get a chance to do, all of us who are used by the Lord as we get to sit back and just watch God move. It's, it's exciting. Do you know that uh, it was mentioned earlier, but I, I just want to say what a blessing this is, that, that on Sunday uh, we had our ba a baptism. Do you know, I, I didn't know this, it was brought to me, that we baptized almost 400 people on Sunday. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Now, now John got baptized 127 times, but... <laughs> But that's, that, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. See, that's what I'm trying to say. When you minister, minister according to the power that the Spirit supplies. Don't do it in your flesh. All ministry is to be by the Spirit of God. It's not through our natural abilities. It's not through our own efforts. Why is that? Because if, if we see success through our, our natural abilities, it produces pride. And in 1 Corinthians 1.29, Paul said, No flesh should glory in his presence. You see, in verse 11, he says that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So all ministry is to bring glory to the Lord and not the person performing the ministry. I think that, again, the church is in such a need of heroes that we mis mistakenly can make a person who ministers effectively into a hero. Be very careful not to do that. There's only one person that we ought to look at as a hero, and that's Jesus Christ. The rest of us are slaves. The rest of us are servants. Each one of us do our part. All of us have an opportunity to work together, but it's all for one purpose, to bring glory to God. And when people begin to lift a man or a woman up, it just, we used to have an old saying, I, don't, I haven't heard it recently, that the higher you go, the farther you fall. And, and when, you, when you're lifted up by man, every one of us, we make our mistakes. And what happens is people get turned off because their hero was a human being. So we have to be very careful to give glory to God and not to seek glory for ourselves. Remember Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts? Remember how they had a parcel of land and there was a time when the church was selling off parcels and putting into a common fund and caring for the poor? And the Bible tells us Ananias and Sapphira had a parcel. They sold it but kept, a, kept back a portion for themselves. And then finally, the apostle Peter had spoken to both of them, and both of them were actually, both of them died because they were trying to steal glory from God and undermining the foundation of the church from the beginning. They wanted the glory of people saying, oh, look how generous Ananias and Sapphira have been. You just can't be that way. You can't do that kind of thing. There was another guy in the book of Acts we saw. His name was Simon the Sorcerer. And he saw that the Holy Spirit was bestowed uh, with the laying on of the apostles' hands. And remember what he did? He went up and said, 
I would like to purchase this. And remember how the Apostle Peter spoke? He said, your money perished with you. You sought to purchase the gift of God. Why did he want that? Because he was somebody who was a charlatan. He wanted the attention. And so ministry should never be done for the applause of man. Ministry is for the applause of heaven. So that God will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And so we have to be aware of that. You know, I'll go on. In verse 12, it says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange things, strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you're reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he's blasphemed, but on your part, he's glorified. So after sharing these things about ministry and caring for one another and, and all of that, he returns to the theme of suffering. And he's once again returning to teach them how to, uh, to uh, thrive during persecution. Now, some were surprised that unbelievers were persecuting and harming them. And under that kind of pressure, they were beginning to become discouraged. They were even becoming confused. And in light of this, he writes, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial. That word strange, don't be surprised, is what he's saying, that you are undergoing such severe trials. Why? Well, because suffering isn't something foreign to a believer. It's something that we've been prepared for. All the way back when Jesus was ministering in Matthew 5, 11, and 12, he said, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets before you. He said in Matthew 10, 22, you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Don't be surprised when people don't want to eat lunch with you. Don't be surprised when people say things about you. That Jesus, it used to be Jesus freak. I don't know what they call me now besides crazy and idiot. I don't know the rest. Don't be surprised. Listen, you, you know, I, I, I can go down rabbit trails with things like this, and I'll, I'll be very careful. Um, I know this. I know that if you are always trying to be liked by people, you'll be liked by no one. So what you need to do is seek the approval of the Lord. And if you have the joy of having a few people in your life who know you well enough to be an encouragement, then you're a very blessed individual. If you have people who love you and they know your warts and still love you, you're a very blessed person. You're a very blessed person. You can't please everybody. So what we want to do is please him. And when you're trying to please the Lord and live to please the Lord, there are those who will come alongside of you who will lift your hands to do the same. But there are others, and you know this and I know this, who do not like what you've become. They don't like who you are anymore, and they might even tell you. And in doing so, it could hurt your feeling. And so the Lord just makes it very clear, guess what? You're going to be hated for my name's sake. It's going to happen. So don't be living for the favor of men. Don't do anything out of the way to become you know, uh, you know, difficult for them. Don't pick fights. Don't, try, don't be self-righteous, but don't be surprised either. When people don't like you, that's just the way it is. In John 16, 3, uh, 33, it says, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation. But take heart, I've overcome the world. In Luke 6, 22, blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you, revile you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. And in 1 John 3, 13, don't, uh, don't marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Why are we who are living a loving and caring life? Why are we treated this way? Some may say, why are our lives so filled with grief and loss, so much pain and so much sorrow? Well, these are, these are trials that are actually coming upon you. 
that is doing a work in you. When he says in verse 12, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, he, he is not speaking of something future. He's speaking of things that are occurring at that time. And these trials try you. There's a purpose, in other words, for it. And what is the purpose of the trials? What is the purpose of the fierce persecution and opposition? Well, they refine our faith. The word fiery is symbolic of purifying. The fiery trial purifies. Isaiah 48.10, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Psalm 66 verse 10, you, O oh God, have tested us. You've refined us as silver is refined. And so these trials are refining processes in order that you might be able to bring glory to God. He's purifying you. Have you ever said, Lord, make me like you? Well, he's answering your prayer. So somebody right now is saying, okay, I'll never pray that again, right? <laughs> but that's what he's doing. He's answer- he said, Lord, I want to be like you. I always point to this, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. You want to be like him? You're going to suffer. That's part of it. Why? Because it purifies you. It, it removes the things that you cling to until the only one you cling to is him. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, don't think it's strange. Don't be so surprised when this is taking place. And he said, instead, verse 13, rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. As he suffered for he, who he was, even so, we suffer for identifying with him. Again, John 15, 18, if the world hates you, keep in mind, it hated me first. And so we partake in his sufferings as part of the blessing of belonging to him because suffering for his sake is part of being a believer. Listen to this, Philippians 1, It has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. People reject you. I remember in our early days, our church was maybe three years old, four years old at the most. And I was teaching a Bible study, and I was sharing this, and I was saying, you know what? Share your faith. People will reject it. You can go through things. But we need to be faithful to share. And the next week, as I was walking into the Bible study, it was a small study, maybe 50 or 60 people. It was a long time ago. I remember walking in, and one of the people in my, in my Bible study was a young man who was, uh, he, he was, he was from the streets. He was a real, real rough kind of guy. You know, he'd, he'd had his time in drugs and alcohol and, and violence and all of that. I'd gotten to know him a little bit. And when I walked in to the study, he's standing there with a black eye. So I walked up to him, and I said, what happened to you? And he says, oh, he says, you know, we're supposed to share our faith, right? I said, yeah. Well, he worked at a particular store, and some big old dude came up and was buying some beer. And this guy's a new Christian, and he wants to share about Jesus. So he tells this big biker guy, he says, you know, you don't need to drink that. And the guy punches him. He said, Pastor, he just popped me right in the face. He said, and I jumped over, he jumped over, over the counter. He said, and I grabbed the guy. And I had him on the ground. And I put my hand back. And then I remembered I'm supposed to love this guy. And I let my hand, and I'm watching this guy. And I'm talking to this guy. And I'm thinking, so that's the fruit of your preaching. You're getting your sheep beat up in, in stores. I felt bad. I really did. I felt bad because I don't want people getting hurt. But it does happen. And if you're faithful, it does happen. There is rejection. Your grandma, your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your friends, your neighbors, school, you name it. There are people who will reject you. And that's why a lot of people are quiet. And yet he says, it's been granted to you for the sake of Christ to suffer. We partake of his sufferings. What does that mean? It's not in what you'd call a redemptive sense. We partake in his suffering because we can suffer for doing that which is right. 
and we partake in his sufferings in that our hearts are broken by a sinful world. Take a moment to look at your world. And after you get over getting angry at it for being what it is, you begin to actually grieve over it. Look at the broken children. Look at the broken babies. Look at the broken mamas who are raising their babies by themselves. Look at the broken men. Look at the broken elderly. If you take time just to look at people and begin to see the sorrows that they live in, the pain that they live in, after a while, you begin to partake in that kind of pain. It begins to be a grief to your heart. It actually awakens you to compassion and, and love because your heart is broken for theirs. How many times have you seen a, a little kid who's lost? I, I remember a, a young boy who was brought by his mother in, his after Bible study, and it was in this room here. And I was standing right down here. And the mama brought this little boy. He, he couldn't have been more than eight years old. Beautiful little guy, a little blonde guy. And his head was down looking at his feet. And I was standing right here. And she said, Pastor, the mama said, Pastor, can you pray for my son? His, his heart is broken. And I'm looking at a little boy, eight years old. And I said, well, of course. She says, his father told him yesterday that he doesn't love him. And that little boy's shoulders began to shrug with tears. And I put my arms around him. And I held him. And I prayed for him. Yeah, Christianity... Being a real Christian, you cry with people. You feel pain with them. You sorrow. You grieve. That's what you do. We're partakers of suffering. Not only just the physical things, but the pain of others. Our hearts can be broken by the pain of this world. We partake of the suffering of Christ when we agonize over those who are lost. We, we partake when we realize the cost of salvation a salvation we received. And we partake of his sufferings when we're treated as he was treated. He says in verse 13, when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. So he's saying the believers are suffering. So look to the future. As we suffer, we're comforted to know that we share with him in glory. Our future home is heaven. And not only will we enter in, but we also receive a reward. And at this time, you're experiencing suffering. But at that time, you're going to have great joy. Like Matthew 25, 23 says, uh, well done, his, his Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So in verse 14, if you're reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he's blasphemed. On your part, he's glorified. So he, he's alluding to Jesus' teachings on the Sermon on the Mount. Again, he had spoken in, in Matthew 5 about being insulted and persecuted and things being falsely said about us. So in identifying openly with Christ, he's saying you can be rejected by everyone. But one of the scriptures that has been dear to my heart is Psalm 27.10 when my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take care of me. So there's this love that you have for Christ. That's what gave me as a young man a little, uh, a, a little punk, a little a doper, who, uh, you know, my last month before coming to faith in Christ, I had dropped over, over 20, 30 pounds because I wasn't eating. And I, was, I wasn't a big person at all at that time. And, and, and I... I dropped 30 pounds. I was down to 140 pounds right in that area because I wasn't eating. I was drinking and I was smoking pot and, and I had, it was a month, over a month. And I was, I was gone. And then the Lord saved me. And I went home 
And I told my parents, you're going to hell. And you need Jesus. And both of them came to faith in Christ when I shared with them the gospel because they saw the transformation. But you know what? I loved them so much I wanted to tell them the truth. I didn't want to go to heaven without them. And that's what I told my dad. I said, Dad, you're a good man. You're the best man I'll ever know. But you will be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. And I said, Daddy, I love you. And I never said that to my father, by the way. I wasn't one who said I love you. People, people see me today, I'll say this quickly, and they say, well, and David, David says he loves his wife all the time. Ask her how it was when we first got married. I never said I love you. I thought it was kind of an insecurity on her part to even need to hear that. I mean, I love you. I work, right? You know, I provide food for, the, for you to eat, right? I mean, I'm here. I haven't left. I'm not going out on you, right? Why do I have to tell you I love you? Well, because it's the right thing to do. Because she wants me to say that. And because I have to die to my own self and my pride and minister to my wife in a way that's most effective and demonstrates my love. I had to learn a lot of things because I was very cold. And so my father knew that about me. So when I said, I love you, I didn't say that to anybody. I didn't say that to anybody. But I said it to him. My father never told me he loved me till I was 17. I had never heard that from my father. I love you. I never saw weakness in my father. My father didn't cry. He didn't show emotion. My father was stoic. And now this punk is saying, I love you. And I don't want to go to heaven without you. And as good as you are, you're going to hell. My dad wanted to hit me, and I don't blame him. He, he told me that. He said, you know, I almost hit you. But when you said you loved me, that's what hit me. See, so I've been praying to learn to love since I got saved. 53 years. It's been my constant prayer because Christ loved me. I want to love others. And so God is moving in us. And I know that by telling the truth, even if I'm forsaken, my God will take care of me. And he goes on in verse 14, and I'll close. Rejoice for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. The Holy Spirit will rest. He'll bring relief to you. And he produces the glory in your life. And so finally, let none, verse 15, of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? If the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. I have so much more to say. I'm just going to abbreviate this study and I'll pick it up because I don't want to just rush through this because this is important. Let me see. Where can I stop? I'm going to stop here. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to stop here. Why? Because I want to take you through 15. I have so much more to give. I just went too long today. Um, I'll talk to the pastor about talking too long. <laughs> Let's just rejoice for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon us.